you're standing in this this beautiful vineyard and there's a 20 foot like wall of you know volcanic rock that used to be lava framing the vineyard and you're looking at this giant wall of rock thinking this was once on fire and could have leveled not only these amazing old vines but this amazing old farmhouse that had been here since you know the 18th century Hello! Welcome to The Corner Table, a Capital Times podcast about food and drink in Madison, Wisconsin. Bob Haymauer just got back from a pretty amazing trip to Sicily. This is an island in the Mediterranean where part of the terroir is an active volcano. Lava can threaten centuries-old vineyards as well as people's homes, and the wines coming out of there are pretty extraordinary. Bob is a partner in Cork and Bottle on East Johnson Street, and he brought back some great wines and some really good stories, some of which we'll talk about today. I am your host, Cap Times food writer Lindsay Christians. I have told that volcano story like three times since Bob first told it to me, and I'm really excited to share the whole thing with you today. Get ready for a taste of Sicily. Hello, Bob. Hey, Lindsay. Welcome back. Thanks. It's you got you got back from Sicily what, like six weeks ago? Yeah, right around there. Sounds sounds right. I mean, it's that thing when you travel that it seems like yesterday that you were there, and it also seems like a lifetime ago. So you know, time is a little bit elastic, and that's not just because of the jet lag. How long did the jet lag last? Well, uh, <laughs> this is super interesting, but uh, I, not actually that long. I'm pretty good at it, but I used it as an excuse to start getting up earlier in the mornings. You know, really make myself a better human being, if that's a measure of how good of a human being you are is what time is you get it? up in the morning. I, I think it depends on who you ask. And, and you're asking the, me and I'm going with no. No, yeah, okay, um, that's fair. I, I, <laughs> night I can owl. concur. Yeah, yeah. I, I can concur. So, but the the wines in Sicily, I've had some of mm-hmm. occasionally, but I would love to just sort of hear why, why did you decide you wanted to go to Sicily to drink wine? Well, uh, Sicily is an amazing place. I've been a fan of a few winemakers um, in Sicily for a while. Um, so we, we went down there uh, partly because uh, my wife and I have a friend who actually winters in Syracuse. So we wanted to visit her. And we also, uh, she's a force of nature, and we just wanted to kind of see what her Sicilian life was like. But the wines are always really, they're, they're really ephemeral, they're beguiling. They're, um, the wines that I really love from Sicily, there's um, the you know the thoughtfully made kind of more handcrafted ones are uh, they're they're delicate and amazing and really uh, speak to a sense of place in a way that um, wines from maybe more well known areas it's harder to find those wines that speak to to a sense of place and there's a, a movement with relatively younger winemakers on the island that are making really exciting wines, really trying to reflect that place. And because Sicily is special, it's weird, you know. It's um, it's a very, it's not, it's not an affluent part of Italy. Um, it's, you know, it, it's incredibly beautiful. The, the, you know, the, sh- <laughs> you know, the coast, the coastal area. I mean, Mount Etna is. It's an active volcano. So when we were flying from Rome to Catania, there was just, you know, this plume of smoke coming up from Etna. And you're just like, oh, you know, and the island itself is one of those areas, you know, in my mind, I kind of compare it to like Andalusia in, in Spain, right? It's been conquered and reconquered so many times that the culture is really unique. Um, you know, it was Greek and it was, you know, conquered by the Moors and it was, you know, Italians and then Greeks. You know, it's just like this kind of, this this amalgam of these different cultures in Mediterranean cultures that make it a really unique and special place, um, you know, from the food and, and, you know, obviously the wines are, they can be really stunning. When you talk about the wines being delicate, does that mean that they don't necessarily travel well or that they don't age well? No, I I, I apologize for the, maybe some imprecise language. I, what, they tend to be really high toned, you know, the kind of like elegant wines that um, I gravitate towards because they're really um, food friendly and they're aromatic and um, at least the better ones. I mean, there's a lot of 
you know, there's a strong tradition in Sicily of making kind of industrial product, you know, industrial products in terms of wine. Um, and because it is, you know, that sort of region, like making you know, a poor region, uh, making money doing it is important. So, I mean, this actually in the wine business dates back to, you know, the 19th century when phylloxera kind of eviscerated France. Sicily was one of the places that the French looked to to buy grapes from because phylloxera didn't get there until, you know, 1930s-ish. So it was a good 50 years behind in France. So when this, you know, this little bug <laughs> destroyed all these French vineyards, the French needed to get their wine from somewhere, and Sicily is one of those places. Um, so they would export a ton of their just kind of bulk wine to France where it would be bottled as whatever the French decided to bottle it as. Um, I mean, so there's that there's that tradition. And um, it's still happens, but there's, an, like I said, there's a, a, a current of young winemakers, um, Ariana Occhipinzi in Vittoria in the south, um, uh, Chiara Vigo uh, from Romeo del Castello on Mount Etna um, that are making really, ref- like they are defending Sicilian terroir. They are helping to define it in, you know, as, you know, as the new generation, and they're defending it as well. So those are really exciting wines. What kind of varieties are the most planted, most popular? Well, um, it depends on where, you know, where in Sicily you are. Um, obviously, uh, there's, there's a whole ho- host of kind of really small, um, obscure, especially white varietals like Zabibo and that yeah, is the like, best way. Yeah, ever. That's the one I always gravitate for because it's so much fun to say. Zabibo. Um, but, you know, as far as reds go, and when we're talking about Sicilian wines, the reds are where the statements are being made uh, more frequently, although there are some stunning white wines and some amazing rosés. Um, but we're talking about red grapes like on Etna, Norello Mascalese, to a small, and uh, Norello Cappuccino, which are it's a very small, pla- very small plantings of that. Um, the rest of the island, Nerida Avila and Frappato, are the other two that red grapes that are really. I love uh, Frappato. Frappato, for someone like you who's a fan of Cru Beaujolais, Frappato is. It's my jam. It's delicious. It's, it's so really, good. It really is. And then those. The uh, Norella Mascalese grazed on Etna is vinified with Norella Cappuccino, usually like a field blend in the southern part of Italy. And I'm talking about Vittoria. There's a DOC called Cerasuolo, so DOC being a designated, um, you know, origin area of origin. Um, and that Cerasuolo DOC is a bl- is must be blended for Pato and Neridavolo. So you will, a lot of times you'll see blend a, a Sicilian red, especially from. Victoria, which is um, in that southeastern kind of quadrant, there'll be blends. that Because, you know, the Nero de Avila tends to be a little bit more dark and stewed and brooding. And then the Frappato tends to be a little bit higher toned, brighter, more perfumed. So they really do blend well together. Oh, I believe it. And really food-friendly wines. For sure. For sure. And, you know, it's the thing about um, Sicily is that you know, vegetables are cheap, cheap, cheap. So that's what people eat. Right, like artichokes were ten for a euro, so we had artichokes for lunch, and everyone has artichokes for lunch, right? Tomatoes are in season a good portion of the year, so there's a lot of really you know fresh produce. So these higher toned wines really pair with those kind of vegetable focused dishes, and also because um, traditionally and to the current day, not particular, not a lot of affluence on the island. You know, meat is a luxury. Like we don't experience that in this country because we are fortunate enough to be, you know, as a country, pretty affluent. But meat is a luxury in in most parts of the world, and it is definitely in Sicily. When I think about Sicilian cuisine, um, Mm -hmm. I think about, like, capers and olives and citrus, Mm -hmm. um, but also a lot of fish. Um, I interviewed Alessandro Monticello, who works over at Papavaro, and he he talked about, like, how he, you know, he is a master with fish. He can work with it very easily. Whereas, you know, Francesco comes from uh, further north, Emilia Bologna, mm-hmm. and it's a very, very different cuisine, yep. right? And that's that's interesting to me to see kind of how that's reflected also in the wines that they make. Absolutely. And the styles of the wines they make. Um, and I know that, like, there's a lot of, uh, like, Etna whites, for example, um, that are they can be really funky, mm-hmm. can be really interesting. Um, I don't think of them as like being beginner wines. Like, 
I don't know if I like wine or not. Here's mm-hmm. a wine for you. I don't go at the first in my brain. Yeah. Um, but I but I find them, you know, especially as as I'm learning and I'm drinking more and I'm, you know, f- discovering new regions, like Sicily starts to stand out a little bit as like a place to find really interesting and compelling things. Absolutely. And it, it, I, I think you hit it right on the head there. And, um, you know, the fish, too, is like really, I mean, informs. Like even the red wines, you know, like we were getting paired fish and red wine a ton. And, um, you know, and it's because they're, again, brighter, higher toned, easier, you know, the tannins are a little bit more manageable. So that makes them a good match for some, some fish dishes. So, so the wine that you brought today, is this a winery that you went to? It is, it is. This is, um, this is the Allegra Corre bottling. Um, that is, uh, it's uh, in Sicilian dialect means like place that makes you happy. Um, and this is on Etna. So this is, this is an amazing estate. This is, uh, outside of the town of Rondazzo, which is uh, where we stayed when we were on Etna. And uh, this is a f- an estate that has been in, the, in, the f- in this family um, since like, the early 1900s, but it's been an estate since uh, late 17th, early 18th century. And what, and this is a, a you know a mother Rosanna Romeo and her daughter uh, Chiara Vigo and, and her husband uh, they make the wines on this property and what makes this property special is that it really I mean the terroir is I mean, the wine is very much Etna wine to me it tastes to, like when I think of it it's archetypical in my head you know it's, it's higher toned it's got these really pr- it's got these really pretty you know notes in the nose but. The other thing that makes it really kind of archetypically Edna is that it has this amazing story in relation to the volcano. So in 1981, there was a major eruption uh, of Etna. It's an active volcano. And they started erupting, and a couple days later, the, you know, the lava started coming down the mountain towards the estate. So um, it, you know, they're watching it come. Is there anything you can do besides run away? No. I mean, there's nothing there that that is uh, one of the reminders of how small humans are, right? It's when burning rock is coming towards you, you have nothing to do but leave. Um, but so it's coming, it's coming. It literally stops feet from the vineyard, makes a right-hand turn around the hundred-year-old Norello Mascalese vines, and extinguishes itself in the river. So when you visit, you're standing in this these this beautiful vineyard, and there's a 20 foot like wall of you know volcanic rock that used to be lava framing the vineyard, and you're looking at this giant wall of rock, thinking this was once on fire and could have leveled not only these amazing old vines, you know that have been that have been producing wine since the 1880s. But this amazing old farmhouse that had been here since, you know, the 18th century and where, you know, Chiara and her husband live, it's breathtaking. And the coolest thing about that, like, wall of lava, so you're, you're, <laughs> you're in, like, you visit, you know, you pull up, and this is not like a tourist-friendly, like, winery, right? Like, hard to find, you know, we pull up our cars in the vineyard, you know, Chiara comes, like, running over with, you know, and her dog's there, and we're kind of talking, and we're looking up at Etna and you see these like black, like these frozen black rivers. And you can follow the, you can follow the path of that frozen black river down to the vineyard where it makes this 20 foot wall. And, you're, and we're talking about it and then we walk over to it and she points out a grapevine that is growing out of the rock. So there are vines that were, <laughs> uh, you know, from this vineyard that were destroyed by the lava and now are working their way back up through the volcanic rock. Oh my God. It's, I mean, it is the amazing destructive and creative power of nature in a nutshell. This was jaw droppingly amazing. This is an estate that has a thousand year old olive tree on it. You know, they've got all these pears that had started to bloom when we were there. It was and it was great. It was we got to make this connection with this woman, Char, who makes these wines. She did not start out making wine. She was an artist. She was uh, she studied art, 
and she did, her area of expertise was wine labels, and she actually started tasting wine, fell in love with it, and decided to move back to her family's estate and make wine starting in 2007. So this is, previous to that, they just sold off grapes to cooperatives, but never really made their own wine. So she started making wine on the estate in 2007. Um, and the Allegra Corre is the name of this bottling, but it's also the name of the parcel, like kind of the area out, um, outside of Rondazzo on Etna, where the estate is. Um, this is, they make three wines at this estate. This one, which is kind of their fresher expression, they make a, one called Vigo, which is Chara's last name. They also make uh, a rosé, which is super limited. Only a couple thousand cases of that gets made a year. Um, hopefully we'll see some here in the market this year. But um, that is this wine. Why don't you let me pour it for you? This is uh, Romeo del Castello is the name of the winery. Um, and Allegra Corre is the name of the bottling. This is mostly, this is like, for all intents and purposes, all Norello Mascalese, although there is some Norello Cappuccino kind of scattered in the vineyard, it's kind of a field blend. They don't really know how little of it there is. But I've always wondered that about field blends, if mm-hmm. actually they they quantify it or not. I think, you know, I think it depends. I think states like this where they've just kind of always been there and no one really thought about it when it went in decades ago. Uh then it's kind of impossible to tell. But, you know, in California where everything was kind of planted and someone knows who planted it and it's been labeled, I think it's a little bit easier to tell. God, it's gorgeous. Isn't it beautiful? Yeah. It's just a just a beautiful nose. Um, it's, it has a lot of floral notes yeah, to me, which actually, yeah, I wasn't expecting. I, was, I, I guess I was expecting, based on the story, I was like, maybe it'll be smoky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, there, the story does invoke a lot of fire and smoke, but no, it's it's very pretty. And again, it's that kind of that duality of you know Sicily. You have this beautiful place, and there are areas of it that are not particularly well taken care of. You know, there's you know this natural beauty, and you know there's we would joke that we had to turn left by the mattress at the side of the road. You know, like, and it's like this. And that's what I really attracted me to Sicily is that kind of contradiction. It's like, it's a very real place. It does not have a lot of artifice, although it has a ton of beauty, <laughs> you know, both man-made and natural. This is such a beautifully integrated wine. Mm-hmm. Um, and by that, I mean that there's nothing, there's nothing sort of spiky or out of balance about mm-hmm. it. It has just, it has wonderful spice notes in it, yep. which I find really nice. Violets on the nose, um, kind of, I get, you know, spice, and that kind of an herbaceousness on the palate, really pretty tart red fruit. Um, there's a little bit of kind of like earthiness. Yeah, there's um, definitely dirt like uh, like yeah. on the palate, but not in a it's sort of barnyardy way at all. Like for me, it's it's much more just earthy. That kind mm-hmm. of lovely, the kind you will sometimes get in Pinot Noir. Yeah, um, from like Oregon, where you get that kind of like forest floor thing happening. And you know, this is all organic. You know, minimal intervention. I think she, only, I mean, she uses as little sulfur as possible. It's, this is um, a wine you can really, I don't know, that's, it speaks for itself. There's a lot of spoofery. You know, this is all stainless age, so there isn't any oak on this bottling. Um, but yeah, I, I can't speak highly enough of, about all of this property's wines, but um, this one in particular, I think, is a particularly great value for under 30 bucks. Yeah. Like if you're having a nicer dinner um, and you're looking for something that's going to really wow guests without crazy breaking the bank, this is a this is a great wine to open up. The tannins are just like they're they're, they're present, but they're not like overly drying or mm-hmm. overly chewy at all. To have someone like like Chiara who's making this wine is really passionate about this place um, from a really special place. That's what is worth spending a few extra bucks on. You know, and I, again, I think this is a $28 bottle of wine right around there. So it's not like nuts. Uh, it's, you know, it's a splurge, but it's like that's what you should spend the extra money on, not to make sure you're paying some mid-level marketing executive <laughs> to come up with a new label. You know, like, and this is, I'm, so I don't know, I, I, I get kind of sentimental and nerdy about this wine, but I can't recommend it enough. It's, it's some of the same principles as you hear kind of bandied around the eat local. Yeah, absolutely. Right, where like the farmer has taken time with something and has invested their time and their labor and their land 
and you pay a little bit more for that than you would for a commodity food product. Mm-hmm. And I think the same is true for for wine. I've, I've been sort of thinking and and considering recently the the difference between quote unquote real wine and the you know stuff you find on kind of the bottom shelves of the grocery store mm-hmm. that is it's so full of additives and you know all kinds of things yeah. that are not are not grape juice yeah right um, and and every every wine is going to have some things in it well most wines are going to have some things in it so that like it doesn't immediately start to firm, like Referment, referment, or, or, yeah, or, yeah. weird, or yeah. It need, you know, you have to protect it. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, there's there's that minimal intervention versus like just sort of maximum manipulation. And yeah. those are the wines that often give me headaches because you know maybe they were over extracted and they added a bunch of water, and now my head is pounding. Yeah. Um, or they so, add a bunch of sugar because there was a, a cold year that year so they add a bunch of sugar to it and make sure that there's a little bit more alcohol and then they add some grape extract to give it a little bit more color and and then what you end up having is a wine that doesn't speak to anything G- exposing people to wines that really express a point of view is fun for me and it, it, no matter what price they are because you can find them at every price level and so these things are available. You you do kind of have to seek them out a little bit, but you know, look for Etna mm-hmm. on that label yeah. and um, try some of these wines. I mean, we're not drinking a, a frappato right now. We're we're drinking a Norella Muscalese, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but but frappato. If you see frappato, if you see anything with the word Occipinti on it, yep, get that. It's so delicious. Ariana Occipinti, as far as is one of the reasons I went to Sicily. Um, but her wines are they're justifiably famous. Um, and I think um, the Romeo del Costello wines, the, the one that we tasted today, are, it's, just, it's a little bit le- lesser known. And I think it's cool to um, ex- expose people to the new things, too. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for bringing this in. Hey, thank you. And thank you for not asking me about the whole rental car debacle. It was a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Next time. All right. All right. Bye-bye. This has been The Corner Table, a podcast about food and drink in Madison, Wisconsin, produced by the Capital Times. Our music was composed by Patrick Christians. Subscribe to The Corner Table anywhere you get your podcasts, and follow us on Facebook at Corner Table Podcast. I am your host, Cap Times food writer Lindsay Christians. Next week, I'll be chatting with Katie Wire, a young chef who's doing some really cool stuff in Spring Green, Wisconsin, so tune back in for that. And my wish for you this week is an arepa stuffed with whatever good things you like. Check out Cap Times for my recent story on Caracas arepas on the Library Mall in Madison. Cheers! Cheers!